Hello again, rail fans. A lot of you have been writing me and asking where I've been. Uh, I haven't posted a thing on YouTube since uh, middle of August, and uh, that's that's a quite a while for me. Um, well, I, I've been busy with some home improvement projects and some other personal stuff. I just haven't had any time to get out at all, and uh, haven't shot anything recently uh, either. Um, plus. Uh, this past summer, this August, was a really, really hot August and just didn't want to get out too much in that, uh, that heat and humidity. And our humidity has been murder in Florida. We had a lot of tropical weather moving over us this year. Anyway, just, just really, really hot. So I decided I needed to get something on the air for you guys. So I spent the past week digging out one of my old projects. In fact, my very first video project that I ever produced back in 1995. Now, when I shot this, along with a uh, photographer friend of mine, this was pre 9-11. Security was a lot different then, and we were able to get into places that you couldn't possibly do now. CSX gave us incredible access to their operations in Florida's Bone Valley Phosphate Mining Region. We rode trains, we got into strip mines, transloading facilities, just all over the place. Stuff you could never get today. Also, something you should be aware of, this was the era of standard def video. Uh, which uh, long before HD. Uh, plus, we only had access to DV Cam, which was one of the earliest video compression technologies. Not great, certainly not as good as Beta Cam or Beta Cam SX uh, or SP or any of those. So it was kind of marginal at best, and once you uh, blow it up to an HD uh, screen, it, it looks kind of chunky. But back then on the old, on the old glass uh, CRT screens, it looked pretty good. But uh, by today's standards, not so hot. But for those of you who don't uh, own DVD players, which is the only way you've been able to see this at this point, uh, here is a look at my first distant signal production way back in 1995, Trains of the Bone Valley. It's just before sunrise on an August day in Central Florida. At the CSX yard in Mulberry, engineer Bobby Rogers climbs aboard his locomotive. This morning, the power is a pair of EMD six axle units, SD40 2s. The first order of business is to get permission to take the train out onto the main line. That comes from the CSX dispatcher in Jacksonville. On this day, it's J.L. Adams sitting at the BC console. 0820, we're ready to come out of Mulberry Yard and get the line to Ridgewood Pass, picking up, over. 0820, get the northwest switch, south Mulberry Normal, and you've got the line out south in the vitamin C, the SV50.1, picking up at Ridgewood, over. We're on the Valrico subdivision heading south. It's true that morning sun is rising from the east, but since all CSX Florida trackage is timetabled either north or south, we're heading south. Five minutes down the main line, we reach milepost SV846, Ridgewood, a passing siding that's often used for storing cars. This is where our train awaits. Jim is using hand signals to communicate with Bobby on the locomotive. We'll see some cabooses in the Bone Valley today, but OA-20 doesn't get one. Just the usual end-of-train radio telemetry device. See, it gives you the air pressure and the motion. That gives you better train handling. The engineer knows when it's moving. And that is our train, OA-20. 
two big engines, and 50 empty hopper cars. But they won't be empty when we get back here later today. Let's take a minute to see where all this happens. The Bone Valley is situated in central Florida, in between and just south of Tampa and Orlando. CSX inherited a whole system of railroad built solely for transporting phosphate from mine to processing plant to awaiting ships on the coast. The tracks are nearly all former Atlantic Coastline or Seaboard Airline rails. The two companies battled for Bone Valley business for 60 years before finally merging in 1967. The process begins here. Surface mines all across southern Polk and Hardy counties. Massive walking drag lines scraping the ground for phosphate, which will eventually become part of fertilizer, laundry detergent, even soft drinks and toothpaste. At one time, 80% of the world's phosphorus supply came from this small corner of Florida. This is the Mosaic Fort Meade mine in Hardy County. Each scoop of that drag line brings up 42 cubic yards of earth. The bucket is big enough to hold two Ford F-150 pickup trucks inside. Raw phosphate, called the matrix, is dumped into the pit, where it's mixed with water into a slurry. The water gun car shoots thousands of gallons of water every minute, and yes, all of the water is recycled. Steel pipelines carry the slurry as far as five miles to the first plant. There, it is sifted, separated, and mixed with more water. In this state, it's called wet rock. This is the point at which phosphate begins traveling by rail. On its way to pick up that wet rock is train OA-20. On this day in 1995, we caught it with a pair of new GE-8 locomotives in the lead. Coming out of Ridgewood Pass on the Valrico subdivision, Bobby and Jim are heading to South Fort Meade. We're crossing State Road 60 as we enter the town of Bartow. These tracks were, at one time, part of Seaboard's route from Tampa to Miami, but that all ended in the 1980s when the SAL line was cut at Bartow. There, the route now makes a 90-degree turn onto ex-Atlantic coastline rails. Heading through Fort Meade, the southbound train is actually heading south on the map now. This is ACL's Lakeland to Fort Myers route that once hosted connections to the West Coast Champion and Havana Special. The line now terminates in Bowling Green, just a few miles to our south. The big drag lines work 24 hours a day in the Bone Valley, and so do the trains. The last major customer on the line is now here at Tencor, the South Fort Meade mine. In 1995, when we shot this, it was owned by Cargill Fertilizer. Cargill has since absorbed the other major mine operator in the valley, IMC. After the merger, a new company was created, Mosaic. OA-20 is now switching onto the South Fort Meade Mine Spur. To access the mine, we have to cross the Peace River. CSX built the concrete bridge just for this customer. It's evidence of the importance of phosphate to the railroad. Back aboard the 8101 engine now with Bobby and Jim, and barely an hour after we started our trip, 
we're pulling into the mine loader. This is where we'll fill our 50 hoppers with wet rock, pulling the train under the loader at three tenths of a mile per hour. We're gonna cut the train off and they're gonna come down with their engine and pick up those cars and drag them down through the dumper. We're gonna weigh them so that once we start loading and we pull the train over the scale a second time, they'll weigh the car again and then they'll know how much commodities they put in that car. This loading system was installed in 1995, just before we shot this trip. Remember all that wet rock that we left back at the phosphate pit? A system of pipes has carried it here. Then a conveyor belt brings the commodity up from the holding pit into the loader, where it's automatically measured into carloads. Bobby has backed his engines onto the train and the loading begins. Mosaic employees in the control cab keep careful watch as the wet phosphate is dumped into the hopper cars 100 tons at a time. The loader may be computer controlled, but the train rolling underneath is all manually run by a man with seat of the pants engineer skill. The way they have their operation set up out here is for two to three tenths of one mile per hour. You've got to kind of really be careful easing this thing at the speed we have to pull it through to, for them to dump it. As they go from one car to the next, see there's a momentary pause in there that they're not dumping phosphate. During that little brief period of time, I could actually gain too much speed. So in order to maintain proper speed, and I have to fluctuate my amperage up and down in small increments. As slow as we're going, our speedometer won't record that. But the main thing is, is watching your amperage and, uh, and your speed. Like I say, I have to kind of watch the ground to make sure I'm kind of controlling at a constant speed. And it's uh, kind of a tricky little operation, but uh, we can do it. Each car hold 100 tons, 200,000 pounds of phosphate. The car weighs approximately 50 or 60,000 pounds. So each car loaded is approximately a quarter of a million pounds of weight. It's a tedious precision operation, one car after another. We can usually load a 50 car train in about an hour. And just over an hour later, it's done. That's the loader, 50 cars back there in the mist. Now OA-20 is ready to haul all that phosphate back to where we started. At the same time that Bobby and Jim are getting ready to return north, a dozen other jobs are hauling fertilizer trains in the Bone Valley. One of the busiest spots is Pierce on the Aiken subdivision. We're shooting from the Highway 640 overpass as train O802 pulls a string of loaded hoppers to a processing plant a few miles away at Green Bay. It's easy to tell the state of phosphate being hauled in the Bone Valley. If the hoppers are open, the product is still wet, fresh out of the mine or washer plant. If the cars are covered, it's processed fertilizer, which is ruined if gotten wet. O802 pulls up to the Aiken Junction to switch on to the Bone Valley Sub and swing over to Farmland Hydro's Green Bay plant. Four miles west on the line, 0802 pulls into Green Bay. This is a typical run in the Bone Valley, 
heavy trains running short hauls between mines and plants. Another hot spot is seven miles south of Mulberry on the Aiken subdivision. The citizen recalls it Bradley Junction, but to dispatchers and train crews, it's just Bradley. The Aiken sub, to the right, is ex-seaboard trackage, built by the railroad in the early 1900s, connecting their newly acquired Charlotte Harbor and Northern Line at Bradley up to the town of Mulberry. It's why mileposts on the Aiken sub start at zero here and count up toward Mulberry. Tracks to the left are the Brewster sub to Edison, also ex-seaboard. Bradley serves many trains as a turning spot to gain access to one sub or another and to and from the southern end of the Bone Valley. 0832, a mine job out of nearby Hooker's Prairie, has just come in, back down past the junction, and will turn north toward Mulberry. 0802, the same job we saw earlier at Pierce, is coming back out of Green Bay with empties. It's technically the same job, though the two trains are running about 10 years apart. O829 is coming off the Agricola side of the diamond to return to the mine at New Wales, stopping before crossing, like all trains at Bradley must do. It's all track warrant authority in this area. Instead of whole blocks, the dispatcher gives trains pieces of the line at a time. We're Bradley, 808, 1646, 82, and have a line from Bradley to Aiken, Houston, Brewster, Lido. The crossroads of the Bone Valley is here at Mulberry. ACL's Bone Valley sub crosses SAL's Valrico sub, right in the middle of Highway 37. Just across the highway is the old SAL Mulberry Depot, now the Mulberry Phosphate Museum. Inside, we learn why they call this region the Bone Valley. The remains of prehistoric mammals are the featured attraction. In the process of strip mining phosphate, bones are unearthed, many of them from creatures that roamed Florida long before man or the trains got here. The skull of a saber-toothed cat or an ancient manatee skeleton are typical examples of the bones found in these mines every year. Speaking of mines, let's check in with Bobby Rogers and Jim Martin aboard 0820, working the train north out of Fort Meade back to the drop-off point near Ridgewood. Trackage in this part of Florida looks tabletop flat, but there are grades, and 0820 is climbing one now. These two big engines handle the 50 cars that we've got today pretty easily. Now, we had 70 or 80 or 90 cars would be really struggling a little bit harder to get up these hills. We're running number eight throttle position, that's wide open. For Bobby and Jim, train 0820 of August the 11th is only the latest of hundreds of trips the two have made together. Jim's been on the railroad 32 years. I've been on the railroad about 27. 
but as far as working together, probably close to 17 years off and on. You spend uh, probably more time with your fellow worker out here than you do with your uh, family. Pretty day for a train ride. Pulling into Ridgewood, we're moving out of track warrant authority and into CTC control, and the signal is red. 0820 over. Train 0805 is pulling into the plant spur at Cargill Fertilizer's Ridgewood plant. Here, one of the cabooses we mentioned earlier. They're used in the Bone Valley for trains that must make long reverse moves. And CSX doesn't call them cabooses anymore. Now they're labeled shoving platforms. A few minutes later, we're still waiting, this time for train 0834, another job coming out of Cargill Ridgewood and carrying a custom built CSX shoving platform. Finally, we're a quarter mile north on the line and backing into our drop-off point, a junction on the Valrico sub called North Bonnie Y. Jim cuts the train off and we'll move engines light back to Mulberry Yard. It's the end of the day for train 0820 and crew, but those 50 loaded hoppers will be on the move again shortly when a crew from Tampa will come out to take the train to a phosphate plant on the eastern shore of Tampa Bay. The Valrico subdivision is really Main Street from the Bone Valley to the ports on Tampa Bay. Out of Mulberry, Edison Junction is the first hot spot. This is where the Brewster sub, another busy mining route down to Bradley, joins with the Valrico. Here comes one of the regular trains from Tampa, coming back for more phosphate with her string of empties. 2220 is an old Chesapeake and Ohio GP35, now serving as a road slug a unit with the diesel engine removed. The electric traction motors get their power from the attached mother unit. Railroad technical folks figured out a long time ago that locomotive engines often generate more electric power than they can use. So by adding more sets of wheels, in this case with a road slug, you get a lot more pulling power, almost for free. The CSX slugs were old de-engine units, but the crews like them because without that big engine laboring in the back room, it's quiet in the cab. This train is headed onto the Brewster sub that leads down to New Wales, Bradley, Brewster, and Agrock. Edison is a good spot for seeing these slug sets because trains often have to stop to line the manual junction switch. Train 0806 is staying on the Valrico sub. He's bound for Mulberry Yard. Here's another GP30 converted to a road slug. It's 10 miles an hour around the sharp turn at Edison as the covered hoppers clank along. A few minutes later, a northbound train, 0842, pulls by. Headed to Tampa with a string of rotary covered hoppers. We'll see these in action later at the Rockport Dumper. One point six miles further north on the line toward Tampa is another junction. Welcome. Train 0851 is hauling empty south toward the Bone Valley. The lead unit, a GP30 converted to a road slug and repainted. But check out the third unit, 2545, still in SCL colors. 
Mornings are a good time to see the Bone Valley Parade. The phosphate trains from Tampa are fleeted in and out of the valley, one after the other. Train 0840 is next in line, a road slug bracketed by two GP40s. Short time later, here comes 0841. The slug in the lead is another D-engine GP30. You'll see on the open top unit trains there is often a lone white covered hopper at one or both ends. Later on we'll show you why they do that. Eleven miles north of Welcome is Plant City, a major crossing for CSX. This is where the Atlantic coastline's Tampa to Sanford, Maine, crosses Seaboard Airlines' Tampa to Baldwin, Maine. It's also where the Plant City sub comes up from Welcome Junction. A regular through Plant City is 0821, a phosphate mine run from Hardy County, deep in the Bone Valley, to Central, near Zephyr Hills. Named Central for the Central Farmers Fertilizer Company, it's the home of CF Industries phosphate operations. Several trains deliver raw materials to Central each day. You're likely to see one of those trains on any evening in downtown Plant City. On the third Saturday of each month, the town hosts a vintage car meet in the parking lot of the old train depot. One of the unscheduled features is usually 0825. A local from the Port of Tampa to Central hauling loaded ammonia tanks. The train is nicknamed the Truck Eliminator because CSX lured the business away from over-the-road trucks. The northern gateway to the Bone Valley is Winston Yard near Lakeland. In the 1980s, newly formed Seaboard System and its parent CSX saw the growth of the city of Lakeland as a limiting factor in its Bone Valley traffic. The old Atlantic Coastline Yard near downtown was bordered by a slope to the west, a lake to the south, a giant tile plant to the east, and growth from all directions. It would never get any larger. So CSX expanded its tiny Winston Yard west of town to accommodate all of the non-port traffic in and out of the valley. Today, sulfur, potash, and ammonia come in through here and finished DAP and other fertilizers go out. On trains like this K440, a Bone Valley unit train of northbound jumbo hoppers and empty tanks. He's just come out of Winston and is passing the site of the old Lakeland Yard. That's the field off to the right. All Bone Valley port jobs must come to Tampa Bay to offload their commodity. The trip funnels them onto the Yeoman Sub, the ex-seaboard mainline called the S-Line. Here, train 0851, headed by a pair of newly acquired SD-70s, hauls dry rock loads down the Yeoman Yard bypass. The bypass leads around the corner from the S-Line to the XACL Tampa Southern Line. Train 0844 is pulling wet rock loads bound for East Tampa. The signal still bears the initials of the old line TS.
from the expressway, we're looking down on Adamo Drive and the TS signal. This is train 0852, more wet rock loads headed for East Tampa's Mosaic Processing Plant. Water crossings are a fact of life in Florida railroading. At Palm River, a half mile south of TS, train 0844 crosses on a bright March afternoon in 2006. Yes, sir, Lane, CSX T4696, CSX 0844. 16 under authority number 53846, release the Alpine Echo Blocks, two blocks, no switches handled, over. All right, 53846, engine CSX T4696, lane clear the Alpine Echo Blocks, two blocks, no switches handled, R-E-L-O. 44416 uh, on authority number 539154, engine CSX T4696, lane copy and absolute south end north direction in the big bend block, one block. In 1999, CSX began an ambitious program to rebuild some of its older, smaller covered hoppers. The old cars were refitted with extensions, and the result is these new extended height covered hoppers. The cars were refurbished at Tampa's Yusita Project Shop. A mile south on the Tampa Terminal Sub is Sutton Siding with its Y that breaks out into the Rockport, Lou, and IMC terminals. An early morning train loaded with chemical fertilizer has been ordered to back into the yard. And it's not long before another job is knocking on the door. Rockport is the busiest of the transloading ports. Owned and operated by CSX, it was built by predecessor Seaboard Coastline as a first-of-its-kind phosphate facility. Ships from all over the world tie up here to be loaded with Bone Valley fertilizer. Trainmaster Dennis Carroll is in charge of keeping the trains busy, feeding this giant operation. We have 14 road switchers on an average daily um, run through Rockport. We, um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. We run six out in the mornings, five to six out at night, and have three local switchers that uh, maintain our dumper operation here at Rockport. In the yard, the trains are cut, regrouped, and made up according to customer needs. All right, let me know when you got it. Y'all change the hole now. All right, I'll be the call. Come on. Get 
Yeah. It's a constant. It's a never ending, never caught up, never slowed down operation. It stays constant every day. Hey, hey, boss. We turn cars on a rapid basis. Uh, these cars will make four, five, six turns a week, where a normal boss car maybe only turn once or twice a month. And they're constantly on the move. All of the thousands of cars coming into Rockport are funneled into the two transloading facilities that convey the fertilizer to the ships. Headed to the dumper now, conductor Cliff Dimmick rides a long train of loaded cars around the giant Rockport Loop. Each car holds between 70 and 100 tons of diammonium phosphate, or DAP. The challenge is to unload them efficiently. And how do you do that? Through the bottom hopper doors? That's too slow. How about 100 guys with shovels? No. These cars are unloaded the same way you empty a wastebasket. Just pick it up and dump it out. The rotary dumper works just that way. Massive hydraulic arms grab the car on all sides, holding it fast to the rail. Then the whole thing is turned about 170 degrees and all that fertilizer pours into the pit 40 feet below. It all takes about two and a half minutes. In the dumper control room, operator Wayne Taylor carefully monitors the operation. An electric arm and cable system precisely handles the train through the dumper, so no locomotive is needed. The special cars are equipped with rotary couplers, and that allows them to swivel. That's why you'll often see a lone white rotary car on the end of a string of phosphate gondolas. So that the automatic dumper has a rotary car to grab onto at the end of the train. Some crews call them idler cars. From the dumper, the phosphate travels on a network of belts to the ship. The long loading arm moves up and down the ship's open hold. Crews evenly distribute the fertilizer so that the ship remains level in the water. This boat is bound for Korea, so the load must be level and correct for the journey half a world away. Several ships a week call at Rockport to carry Florida phosphate fertilizer to farms around the world. The flow of phosphate is unbroken as another hopper load of fertilizer is emptied into the conveyor system. Out of the dumper, the long string of empties snakes around the loop track. It's not long before the yard switcher hooks onto the empty train and hauls it back to the ready yard.
The trains often stay intact to and from the Bone Valley. But before a train can leave the yard, every car must be checked for roadworthiness. That's when car inspector Kenny Robinson goes to work. First, the safety part, a blue lock on the track switch, and the blue flag protecting the track. If it's not locked, they could come in from the other end or anything and move the train on you. That way you're, uh, if you're the only one you don't have to worry about movement or nothing, you can go ahead and inspect it. In a business that travels on wheels, Kenny travels on his feet. It's his job to walk the train and check it all. Check all the safety appliances, you check your brakes to see if the brakes are cut out, check the wheels, the trucks, <clears throat> all your brake rigging, and check to see if there's any shoes wore out. <clears throat> you have to check the couplers, hoses, just barely inspect the whole car. Cars that have faulty equipment called bad orders are yellow tagged. This phosphate train is nearly a mile long, nearly a hundred cars, and Kenny checks every one of them, walking all the way. After Kenny is finished, the yard switcher crew hooks on and pulls the whole thing over the yard hump. The bad orders that Kenny found have to be cut out because bad orders, like bad apples, can spoil a whole train. The process is done the same way it's been done for decades, over the hump. Bad cars to the right, good cars to the left. The yard engine is now shoving back. As the defective cars come over the hump, the coupler pin is pulled, brakes are applied, and the wayward hopper rolls on its own down the bad order track. The brakeman then throws the switch and the good cars are released to go the other way. Once all the bad order cars are called, the train is pulled back over the hump to the repair track, where the work will be swift. Bone Valley cars don't sit idle for long. In the mornings, the fleet back to the Bone Valley begins. But lucky rail fans will often catch Florida's most familiar unit train, the Tropicana Juice Train. Bright orange refrigerated cars are loaded with fresh orange juice at Tropicana's plant in Bradenton, 32 miles south on the Palmetto Sub. That's the end of track for CSX in West Florida. The train is raced north from the Bradenton plant to Tampa, where a new crew takes over. Standard power on the juice train is two General Electric Dash 8s. Or, as seen here in early 2006, two ES44 DC locomotives, nicknamed Jeevos. The juice train is a priority job, but the time to move it on the Tampa Terminal subdivision is short because the Bone Valley Parade is beginning. Out of Rockport, out of Big Bend, out of Port Manatee, the empty trains are coming. Emerging from Rockport, a train of dry rock empties is bound for one of the big diammonium phosphate plants in the Bone Valley.
15 minutes later, the next job is coming out. The engine sets of these Bone Valley trains mostly make the same round trips every day. That's why we've caught the same ones in different locations. Engine 2220 is pulling a train of jumbo covered hoppers back to the valley. So there was Bone Valley back in 1995. You, uh, it certainly doesn't look like that anymore. Uh, the mines are still a lot the same. Transloading facilities are still pretty much the same. Virtually all those locomotives that you saw in this production are gone now, um, or have been have been uh, refurbished into something else or sold off. Um, but anyway, I thought you might enjoy this look back. Also, I got another addition to my. Uh, my backyard fence back there. This is an actually a, an Ad Lake um, end of train marker that I've had for 20 years, over 20 years. A very, very good friend of mine bought it for me when we went to our first Jacksonville train show back in 1998. I just expressed uh, an interest in it and he, he just bought it for me right there. And it's been hanging in my shed without any electric hookup. So I finally got around to uh, to putting a light bulb in it uh, and wiring it up. Unfortunately, because these, uh, these old Ad Lake end of train markers, they hung on the ends of cabooses, uh, they were designed, the, the, the lenses were designed for a kerosene flame, uh, which is closer to a soft white light bulb, uh, 3200 Kelvin. Uh, but that, unfortunately, uh, today is a 5200 Kelvin or 5600. It's a daylight balanced light bulb, so the so the lens looks kind of blue. It's supposed to be green. This was uh, this was an end of train marker. It's it's three greens and a red on the other side, and uh, they spun them around. Anyway, I'll explain that uh, uh, in the next video. Anyway, please like this one if you uh, if you liked it. Uh, send me uh, comments down below. I try to read all of them and reply to as many as I can. Or email me at railfandanny at gmail.com. I try to reply to uh, every one of those. And uh, now that the weather's cooling off, we're going to be back out there shooting some more train stuff and, and finding some, uh, some more interesting stuff for you, I hope. Till then, we'll meet up again somewhere out there on the high iron. This is Danny Harmon.